Hello, uh, welcome everybody uh, to this press conference uh, and also to those tuning in. Uh, my name's John Lang and I've got the uh, great privilege of leading uh, a consortium project called the Net Zero Tracker. So today, uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about our new report in the pipeline, the status of fossil fuel phase out commitments across nations, regions, cities and companies with net zero targets. It's great to finally be talking about the main thing that we need to do to solve climate change. Uh, today I'm joined by three esteemed panellists. Uh, my colleague uh, Natasha Lutz, uh, she is the co-data lead at the Net Zero Tracker and studying for a PhD at the University of Oxford. We've also got my other colleague, Dr Steve Smith, Executive Director of Oxford Net Zero and CORE, uh, aligned with the University of Oxford, and he is also a coll colleague of mine at the Net Zero Tracker. And finally, we have Sapora Berman, Chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative and International Program Director at Stand Earth. So what is the Net Zero Tracker and what do we do? So we are, as I mentioned, a consortium project uh, between ourselves, uh, the Energy and Climate Intelligence Unit, uh, the University of Oxford, specifically Oxford Net Zero, the New Climate Institute based in Germany, and the Data Driven Enviro Lab based in the US. And who do we look at? We look at all nations in the world, all regions in the 25 largest emitting nations in the world, every city with over 500,000 people, and the largest 2,000 publicly listed companies in the world. Essentially, we're a transparency and accountability tool. We fill the reporting gaps out there. There are myriad reporting gaps, and we try and create the most comprehensive database possible using a small army of Oxford University students to collect data. So the, the data we collect are what we call markers of integrity, things like, does a company have a decent plan? Does it cover all of its emissions? Does it specify what it's doing on offsets? And does it have interim targets for near-term emission reductions? Last year, Antonio Guterres commissioned a report by a group called the High Level Expert Group on the Net Zero Emission Commitments of Non-State Entities. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we call it the UN Expert Group. And what they do is they try and address something that Antonio Guterres said that, that Net Zero suffers from, a surplus of confusion and a deficit of credibility. And what we're trying to do at the tracker is align some of our integrity indicators with this UN Expert Group's report. The UN Expert Group's fifth rec recommendation was phase out fossil fuels and phase up renewable energy. So in part because of that, we decided to launch a new indicator um, of phasing out fossil fuels across all of our entities with net zero targets. So I think it's, a bit, it's useful to just mention a little bit of the scope of this report before I pass over to Natasha. So we are only looking at those entities with net zero targets out of our 4,000 uh, entities in the database. So that's about 1,500. We're also looking at all fossil fuel types. We look at coal, oil, and gas. And we also look at all activities, exploration, production, and use. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Natasha, uh, who's going to take us through some of the findings of the report. Well, thanks, John. Uh, we found a gap between the number of entities that have net zero targets and those that are intending to decarbonise through phasing out fossil fuel, fuels or who have made this explicit. Uh, national net zero targets cover 88% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but only 7% of those emissions are covered by at least one commitment to phase out the exploration, production or use of coal, or oil or gas. So in numbers, 30% of nations have pledged to fully phase out at least one fossil fuel. Companies representing 18% of the combined revenue of the world's largest publicly listed companies 
have a full or partial phase-out pledge in either exploration, production or use of coal, oil or gas. So just to briefly explain how we understood each of the different fossil fuel activities, uh, exploration involves looking for deposits of coal, coal oil, or gas. Uh, production activities include the process of extracting fossil fuels for processing, marketing and use, for example, extracting coal from a mine for domestic use or export, and use activities include the burning of coal for electricity generation and use in industry. So for three, each of these three activities, we coded entities as either having a full, a partial, or no phase-out pledge. An example of a full phase-out pledge might be a commitment to stop new exploration of a fossil fuel. A partial phase-out pledge, for example, might be a pledge covering only a certain category of a fuel or a commitment to phase-out coal in power, but not industry. And we also excluded entities that we deemed not applicable. So, for example, at the national level, this could be a country without the relevant fossil fuel reserves, uh, and cities were not included within the analysis for exploration and production targets. Pledges that include only unabated fossil fuel use or a continued use of fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage were not considered as a phase out for the purposes of this report. So for example, the recent pledge by the US to join the Powering Past Coal Alliance didn't change the analysis. So it wouldn't come as much surprise, but we found very little movement overall, but there are some pockets of progress. So for exploration, as you can see on the graph behind me, 94% of oil producing and gas producing countries have not set an oil exploration phase out pledge. For production, a higher proportion of nations have committed to phase out coal production. 13% of coal producing nations have pledged full coal production phase outs. And this represents only 5% of coal production within countries with a net zero target. For oil, only 3% of countries, which is essentially two countries, Denmark and Spain, have set a commitment to fully phase out oil production while 4% have a partial phase-out. And collectively, these full and partial phase-out pledges account for only 0.09% of oil production globally. In terms of use, so the HLEG that John mentioned, the High Level Expert Group, recommends a phase-out by 2030 for OECD-based companies and 2040 for non-OECD-based companies. And although this is stated for companies, we also use it to benchmark nations. So using this H-leg framing for phasing out ambition, we noted that 33% of OECD countries with net zero targets have committed to phase out coal from the power sector by 2030, and only 7% of non-OECD countries with net zero targets have committed to phase out coal from the power sector by 2040. Interestingly, only, the only city with a net zero target that has a full phase out commitment for fossil fuel is Stockholm, uh, which has extended the remit of its phase out to include industry related fossil fuel use. And trickling down into the corporate sphere, as you can see on the graph behind me, we found the sector with the highest percentage of phase outs is in power generation, coal power generation. And in this sector, Austin provides a really interesting example of a company that has successfully diversified its business model away from fossil fuel use uh, and now is predominantly focused on renewable energy. So overall, amongst the discussions of fossil fuel phase outs, there is currently limited data across national, subnational, and corporate ambition. And this analysis that we're presenting today is a contribution to closing that gap. Thanks, Natasha. And over to Dr. Steve Smith uh, to give us some scientific context. Thank you, John. Yeah, so to put this into context, what we know from the best available science, the IPCC, and also the likes of the International Energy Agency, well, it's pretty clear, and we've known for many, many years, that the main driver of the climate heating we're experiencing is, of course, rising levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. And the main driver of that rising CO2 level in the atmosphere is the use of fossil fuels. And we know that every unit of CO2 emitted into the air 
raises global temperature, and global temperature stays raised for centuries or even longer. So if we want to limit global temperature rise to one and a half degrees, two degrees, even three degrees, we have to get to a point where we have zero emissions from fossil, say, from fossil fuels. That means we need to stop using them completely. We need to find a way of uh, preventing those CO2 emissions from fossil fuel use getting into the atmosphere, some form of carbon capture and storage. Or we need to balance out those residual emissions into the atmosphere with some form of equally durable carbon dioxide removal. So um, what are the pathways that might get us to uh, the Paris Agreement goal of one and a half degrees? Well, on the slide, you can see a summary of what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says based on the range of pathways that they assess, consistent with a 50-50 chance of staying close to one and a half degrees. And these are the average numbers, so they have a whole cluster of scenarios, some of which include full fossil fuel fo phase out. On average, they show very strong ramp downs in fossil fuel use. So even this decade, we see declines on average of 75% for uh, energy from coal, and 10% equivalently for energy from oil and gas. And out to 2050, that changes to effectively a complete uh, end to coal use um, and a 60% reduction in oil, 45% reduction in energy from gas. And the International Energy Agency in its net zero by 2050 pathway has very similar numbers actually and a very similar message. It has a decline in oil and gas demand starting this decade, it has zero coal without carbon capture and storage by 2050. Um, and all this, it says, can be done while still providing the affordable energy access that everyone needs. Importantly, this means that energy needs for net zero can actually be met through supply from existing oil, coal and gas fields and mines. Even though we don't stop use completely overnight, it does not require the opening up of new resources, new exploration. And uh, plans for governments and the fossil fuel sector at the moment are going in the opposite direction. Under current policies, the International Energy Agency forecasts that oil and gas demand will roughly flatline at current levels out to 2050. And that means investments in new resources to keep the pipes flowing. This is clearly not aligned with ending climate change in time. Um, one other thing that the science and the, uh, the IPCC and the International Energy Agency are clear on is that carbon capture and storage is a crucial technology for meeting our climate targets. So we should be working hard to scale that too, but it's not a panacea even if it makes a difference. So the IEA estimates that if we continue on a business as usual track, stick to the emissions cuts in the net zero pathway and expect that carbon capture and storage is going to help us out. That's going to require 30 billion tonnes per year of carbon capture and storage by 2050. Currently, carbon capture and storage is at 45 million tonnes per year, three orders of magnitude smaller. It's pretty infeasible that we would get to that amount. Now, carbon capture and storage is going to be important actually for other sectors as well, for dealing with industrial emissions, for actually helping out with carbon removal, taking carbon dioxide back out the atmosphere. So we should treat this as a scarce resource, and while it might play a bit of a role in fossil fuel sector decarbonisation, I don't think we can bank on using this scarce resource to prop up the fossil fuel industry as it is. So a world of net zero emissions and meeting our climate goals is not compatible with continued fossil fuel development. It's compatible with rapid reductions in use, a scaling up of carbon capture and storage where we can and carbon removal, and we have plenty of existing and approved projects to cover what we'll need for fossil fuels. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, and over to Sapora Berman, Chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. Thank you so much. As the Net Zero Tracker report and wider analysis shows, for all our talk on targets and emissions reductions and net zero, there's still a striking lack of commitments and clarity on phase-out plans for oil, gas, and coal, the three products that are responsible for 86% of the emissions trapped in our atmosphere today and causing the dramatic rise in extreme weather, in fires, in floods, in lethal heat. 
We're hearing that national net zero targets cover 88% of global GHG emissions, but only 7% of those emissions are covered by any kind of national commitment to phase out exploration, production, or use of coal, oil, and gas. And then if we look at the bigger picture, the production gap report, the land gap report, emissions gap report, IEA World Energy Outlook, the math around phase out just doesn't add up, despite all the net zero commitments. In fact, the data released by the United Nations Environment Program and the Stockholm, and the Stockholm Environment Institute in the production gap report shows that the world's governments are currently on track to produce double, to produce double the amount of oil, gas, and coal that is, by 2030, than is consistent with our 1.5 degree target. While net zero commitments are growing in number, their integrity is increasingly being challenged due to the limited impact in reducing absolute emissions to date and an over-dependence on technologies, as we've heard, that are not proven at scale, and most importantly, as this report shows, that are failing to address the root cause of emissions, the production of oil, gas, and coal. Under our current swath of net zero commitments, emissions continue to rise. Financial investments continue to rise, in fossil fuels continue to rise. Fossil fuel production continues to rise. Countries and companies are hiding behind the net in net zero. This shows up in a number of different ways that we should all be keeping a lookout for here at COP28. Creative accounting rather than credible action. Loopholes or weasel words, the unabated, the inefficient. Over-reliance on offsets and techno-optimism and only focusing on coal. Only focusing on the power sector. Phase down rather than phase out. And here, even more blatant, a refusal by the president of COP to acknowledge the science needed for phase out. Any climate plan, any net zero plan that does not help secure permanent fossil fuel phase out is not a net zero plan. We have to be very clear of the risks that we're facing. We have good guidance, as we've heard, in the form of the high-level expert group on net zero, but we need to implement it and underpin it with a mechanism to coordinate global phase-out, even if we have huge success here at COP28. And we're able to secure language for a phase-out of all fossil fuels for the first time in 28 COPs. That will be a success, but then we need a plan. How do we manage the wind down of fossil fuel production in line with the demand destruction that we know we're seeing that leaves no country, no community behind? A fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is needed to ensure the transition is by design and not disaster. It plays an important role in solidifying the direction of travel for policymakers, industry, and investment investors and removes the barriers to transformation, innovation, and investment. It creates a more level playing field. It will help us navigate the challenges and issues that arise for a phase out. Right now, every producer country, every company wants to be the last barrel sold. And that's why we're in the situation that we're in. Without a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, the continued growth of fossil fuel supply and production risks undergoing undoing progress made to date, creating stranded assets, and increases the likelihood of our remaining carbon budgets being exceeded. But luckily, after decades of climate negotiations, fossil fuels have been dragged center stage here at COP28, and momentum is now building rapidly behind the fossil fuel treaty proposal. This morning, the Guardian editorial board endorsed the call for the fossil fuel treaty, and here at COP, we saw two more nation states join the growing block of now 10 nation states that are calling for a negotiated mandate for a fossil fuel treaty. Vanuatu, Tuvalu, Tonga, Fiji, the Solomon Islands, Niue, Antigua and Barbuda, Timor-Leste were all joined at this COP by Palau and Colombia, and they're now joining forces to start designing a fossil fuel treaty. Colombia became the first Latin American country to formally join the bloc and is the largest fossil fuel producing country to endorse the treaty proposal. And that's because they know we can't keep making the problem bigger and like the over 2,000 scientists that have endorsed the fossil fuel treaty proposal, they know that we need international cooperation to wind down produ production. 
The fact that 28 COPs have refused to directly address the need for a phase out of fossil fuels is a result of the billions spent in lobbying and public relations by the oil, gas, and coal industries. And countries need to come together to stand up to the fossil fuel industry because these countries and companies that are expanding fossil fuels hold humanity in a chokehold. Five million people died this year from lethal heat alone. Seven million from fossil fuels, from air pollution due to fossil fuels alone. To keep more people safe, to save lives, we need our countries and the companies to act align with the science. And let's be clear, it's not a transition if we're growing the problem. And what we build today will be what we use tomorrow. And that's why ending the expansion of new oil, gas, and coal is absolutely critical. Those making net zero commitments need to align both their actions and their advocacy towards stopping the expansion of fossil fuels and securing a global just transition away from coal, oil, and gas in a manner that is fast, fair, financed, and leaves no one behind. This report lays bare the fallacy that net zero targets can be met while countries continue to expand fossil fuels. We cannot allow net zero commitments to continue to be a haven for bad math and broken promises. Thank you. Thank you, Sapora. Uh, so we can go to a Q&A for a couple of minutes. We might be able to take a couple of questions if there are any from the crowd. Uh, that puts me on the spot. I didn't prepare any questions. Uh, so I'm going to go over to, to our panellists again. Um, Steve actually has a great analogy about uh, trying to uh, end exploration. Um, so I'm going to put him on the spot. Uh, so over to you, Steve. I bet I have in mind the same analogy as the one that you have in mind, John. Um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a big question at this COP about whether we need a complete phase out and whether that, or a phase down, and whether that is of abated emissions or emissions. Uh, I think the analogy that uh, I've used in the past is, um, imagine that you are driving at 100 miles an hour in a car, and you suddenly see that there's a strong likelihood of an accident close up ahead. Um, what do you do? Well, we can have a discussion about whether you can get down to a full stop in time, 10 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour. Uh, Whatever it is that you can do, it's pretty clear what the near-term action is. You put your foot on the brake, and you certainly don't put your foot on the accelerator, which I think is what you do if you're exploring for more fossil fuel reserves at the moment. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, so with that, I think we can close up, unless there are any other questions. Just scanning the crowd for five seconds. Oh, we've got one. Uh, the woman in the white at, uh, near the back there. Oh, I've stand up, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering during the analysis and the research data gathering process if you found any interesting case studies or examples or trends that you could highlight, for example, between regions or between companies, and if there was any in particular that stood out as having some kind of trend that is better or worse in different areas. Thank you. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, over to uh, Natasha to answer that. Oh, yeah, we have put in the report a couple of case studies, um, Austed, Spain, for, as a national level for, you know, putting their phase out into legislation. Um, so we can catch up afterwards and go through those if, if that's helpful. And does anyone else want to make any other comment? Is it worth mentioning Stockholm as well? Um, yep, which is, Stockholm which is, is Which is basically the leading exemplar um, across all fossil fuel activities. Um, but yeah, uh, like Natasha said, we can uh, take that offline. I think we need to close up now. So thank you very much for attending uh, and for those uh, tuning in uh, live. Thank you. <laughs>